Right, thank you very much, Johnny. Um, it's a great honour and pleasure to be here. This is my first time in Oxford, and this is first my first time in England as well. So I feel very much privileged. I want to express my thanks to Christine, the Oxford Commercial Law Centre, um, Andrew, uh, and Professor Louise Gulliver, who actually invited me to this conference. Um, we have a bit of like work split within our panel, and then because I'm the only academic background speaker in this panel, so I think I should present some of my latest findings about my book. Um, you know, my book is about 380 plus pages, so it's very hard for me um, to present a book within 10 minutes, but I will try to be as succinct as possible. Right, okay, so um, my previous co-panelists have, uh, have presented to you about the um, sort of, you know, roadmap of the Belt and Road. Um, what I'm trying to focus on is the Belt and Road Asia. So Belt and Road has extended to Asia, Africa, uh, European um, jurisdictions. But if there is a Belt and Road transaction, um, a lot of the Belt and Road and the wood jurisdiction and institution would parties like to choose uh, within Asia Pacific. Uh, I'm calling it Asia Pacific because I'm including Australia as well. And then um, we are very interested to study what is the level or levels of development uh, among different seats and among different institutions within the Asia Pacific jurisdictions. Um, as I said, this is a book. Um, at the end of the day, you will see that the book cover, the book was published last year, um, and it's a co-published book between me and um, Justice Anselmo Reyes. Actually, Anselmo Reyes is a, is a justice sitting on the Singapore International Commercial Court, and then who used to be the Hong Kong High Court judge uh, in charge of the commercial and arbitration lists. So we had a bit of sort of, you know, um, the theme of our book is pretty much aligned with the theme of the conference as well. It's a combination of academic, I mean, theoretical and uh, uh, practical perspectives. Um, I would like to show you three tables which illustrate about comparative studies um, in the book. We try to examine um, 12 jurisdictions. You can see the first column. The first column on the left-hand side corner, we study 12 jurisdictions in the Asia-Pacific. Um, these jurisdictions are China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, <coughs> Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, India, and Australia. You will see that it's not really an exhaustive picture. We didn't include Thailand, Myanmar, Bangladesh, um, those kind of jurisdictions. Why we select these 12 Asia-Pacific jurisdictions, we select by caseload. These 12 Asia-Pacific jurisdictions are the jurisdictions where there is a higher arbitration caseload, um, i.e. arbitration is more often used in these jurisdictions than other jurisdictions. So we select the 12 most often used arbitration jurisdictions. You will see that in the first slide, in the first table, I gave you three, what we call as the variables. Um, the three variables are actually about the regulatory environment in these 12 jurisdictions. The first column is, whether these 12 Asia-Pacific jurisdictions, they are the member, what we call states in the private international law sort of, you know, term, uh, you will see that Hong Kong and Taiwan, they are not really an independent state, but um, in the private international law term, they can be called uh, sort of a PIL state. In terms of New York Convention, you know this is a global passport for the international arbitral awards. You will see that with the exception of Taiwan, all the 11 remaining jurisdictions, they are actually member jurisdictions to the New York Convention. Well, Taiwan is a very complicated story. Um, well, you know that New York Convention can only be acceded to by sovereign states in Taiwan um, due to political um, situations. They are not really sovereign state. Uh, but I would say that actually the court in Taiwan are very good. They are not doing bad. Uh, there are actually four levels of the Taiwanese court system, very much similar to that in the mainland China. And then they are doing a lot of work to pay respect to the arbitration agreements and, and pay um, respect to the arbitration awards, uh, which is rendered from foreign jurisdictions. Uh, if my memory serves well, last year, um, the highest court in Taiwan, they gave it that to a foreign arbitral award, which is delivered in Japan, a quite controversial foreign ad hoc arbitral award, which is not very quite often happened in Taiwan. And the Taiwanese courts in the um, sort of, you know, two to one vote um, has upheld um, the enforcement in Taiwan. Now we move to the second column, it's about the model law. Uh, model law, we can't say it's a global, um, global passport, but model law is pretty much, you know, gaining a lot of access to the inter international arbitration community. It, uh, I've highlighted to you in red color about the jurisdictions which are not really the model law 
um, countries or jurisdictions, you will see that with the exception of China, Taiwan, um, Indonesia, Vietnam, all the remaining eight jurisdictions, they are actually um, incorporated model law as their national uh, arbitration legislation. Well, some of the jurisdictions might have a different story. I mean, there might be slight differences in the adoption or adaptation of the model law. Say, for example, between Hong Kong and Singapore, Hong Kong has entirely adopted the model law um, as its sort of, you know, Hong Kong arbitration ordinance. It's pretty much by verbatim. But Singapore has a different story. For those of you, I mean, uh, my Singapore colleagues will know that Singapore's arbitration regime is divided into Singapore Arbitration Act and Singapore International Arbitration Act. It's only the SIAA, pretty much like the situation in Australia. You have the Australian Arbitration Act. You also have the Australian International Arbitration Act. It's only the international arbitration regime that has been incorporated in the model law. Now we move to the most recent major legislation or most recent sort of legislative revision. Um, justice raised and I, we are going to study what are the more diligent jurisdictions? What are the jurisdictions which are very much alert to the most recent regulatory development in the world trend? You will see that I highlighted in blue the jurisdictions which have updated its arbitration legislation after 2010. You will see that among these jurisdictions, the most recent updated legislation occurred in um, Hong Kong in 2017. Actually, Hong Kong is very, very diligent. In the jurisdiction which I represent, over the past five years, there are three times revision to the Hong Kong Arbitration Ordinance already. I will see that Hong Kong is one of the most sort of you know, diligent jurisdiction in revisiting its arbitration regime among the Asia Pacific. But I've also highlighted to you in red color about those less diligent jurisdictions. For example, you will see China, Taiwan, and Philippines, um, which haven't updated its arbitration jurisdictions in the past 20 years. Well, China has a different story. What well, China did update or amend its arbitration legislation in 2017, but this is just a minor amendment. The minor amendment only says that for those who would like to be admitted as an arbitrator in China, in PRC mainland, you have to pass the bar exam or we call it the unified law exam today. But there's no substantial revision to the arbitration law um, in the past 20 years. Now, the second slide is about the economic, or we call it the business environment, or we call it the contextual factors that brought about the arbitration development in these 12 uh, Asia Pacific jurisdictions. Uh, the first column, as you will see, is the FDI in, as the percentage of the GDP. When we submitted our book manuscript, um, then uh, 2015's the latest um, data we obtained from World Bank and uh, IMF. You will see that among the 12 jurisdictions, Hong Kong and Singapore, they are most eager to attract foreign investment. <coughs> well, this column is very, very important. And this column, you will see that why Hong Kong and Singapore, they are doing far better than other jurisdictions, especially when you compare and contrast Hong Kong and Singapore to Japan. Well, Japan is a very wealthy jurisdiction. Japan is very developed in terms of economy, and Japan is very developed in the rule of law as well, as you see the rule of law index. And then the foreign investors, they are very confident in Japan as well. But in the past several years, or in the past couple of years, you will see that Japan is not really heavily reliant on the attraction of the foreign investment. Japan is not really a service-reliant economic structure. Unlike Hong Kong and Singapore, the sheer size of the economy, I mean, Hong Kong and Singapore, they're very small. Singapore is a city-state. Hong Kong is not really a state, but Hong Kong is also very heavily reliant on the service, on the provision of the services. Without the services, um, I mean, the GDP uh, will collapse in these very small jurisdictions. You will also see a list of two other um, indexes about the economy. Ease of doing business. This is about the Kini Confidence Index in 2017. Well, that shows you about the transaction costs. Um, how difficult is it to establish a company uh, whether the information cost is very high. For example, in China, if you would like to establish a company, you need to go through several approval processes for some of the industries. Uh, and the information cost is comparatively higher than that in Singapore uh, and Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, if you would like to establish a company, you just need to do it online. And then uh, even you have only $1 for the registered capital, uh, it will be eligible to establish a company. Uh, GDP per capita, this is a very generally widely used um, sort of you know, index to reflect the, the level of wealthness, level of richness of a jurisdiction. Uh, you will see that actually among the 12 jurisdictions, Australia is the richest. I mean, in terms of GDP per capita, Australia has a very small population. 
And then the second richest is Singapore. No wonder, uh, not surprising at all. I was teaching in U.S. as a visiting professor last August. Actually, I find Singapore is more internationalized than, than Hong Kong. I haven't had much chance to speak in either Chinese or Cantonese. Where in Hong Kong, quite a number of times, I need to speak Cantonese to the administrative staff in my faculty. Well, in Singapore, everyone, um, even the taxi driver, they speak um, English. I think this is quite a cultural difference, uh, as we see about the Chinese societies these days. Uh, lastly, about the rule of law index, you will see that in the rule of law index, uh, Singapore ranks the highest, um, and then Australia ranks the second, um, Japan number three, and then Hong Kong number four. Now, the last page is about what we call is you can say community environment, whether there is an arbitration community. Well, Justice Brace and I, we think this is critically important, and then we might showcase um, Japan um, as well. Why Japan only has um, the annual case load about 20 to 30 in its leading arbitration center. For those of you who have some knowledge um, and impression of East Asia, you know that in Japan, the leading arbitration institution is the JCAA. I don't know how much knowledge you have about Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia. Well, the leading institution in Japan is JCA, Japanese Commercial Arbitration Association. Well, people would think that you know, Japan has a very strong economy. Japan has many world-leading companies, and that there should be hundreds, thousands, if we use the word today, there should be thousands of arbitration, international arbitrations taking place in Japan annually. But the data would show you that in the past five years at least, um, the annual sort of case load in, in the JCAA is only about 20 to 30. Well, most of the Japanese international arbitration cases are, are taking actually outside Japan, in China and Hong Kong and Singapore, even in Korea, rather than within Japan. And then um, it only occurred very recently that Japan started to have the second and third sort of dispute resolution institution, which is in JIMC. Japan International Mediation Center in Kyoto, you know, JCA is in Tokyo. Um, and then a JIDRC, J Japanese International Dispute Resolution Center in Osaka. So which makes JCA less, uh, feel less complacent of itself so that it can move forward. This is about the community. But when you talk to people in Japan, you will see that firstly, in Japan, arbitration is not really taught as a legal subject in the law school. Very few law schools, they teach arbitration, whether in Japanese or in English. Secondly, well, actually, the business sector, they are not aware that arbitration is a very important, viable option for them to pursue for dispute resolution. Thirdly, you will see that there are very few, whether legal scholars or Japanese lawyers or arbitrators, they can be very eloquent in both Japanese and English. So there is a huge, what we call it, the, you can say brain drain or whatever, you know, there, there is a lack of intellectuals um, that are required for establishment of the arbitration community in Japan. What you will see that Japan is not moving that fast and it is not very comparable to the economic status as Japan should stand uh, in, in Asia. Now, moving to, um, to the first column about institution and, oh, all right, I will just finish it. Institution and center, you will see that India is the very exceptional case most of the arbitrations in India are ad hoc. India is the only jurisdiction in Asia which does not even have one national arbitration institution. That, that, really, that explains why most of the Indian arbitrations move to SIAC. And then judicial support, with the exception of Indonesia, even though Indonesia is a member state to New York Convention, it does not necessarily mean that the judges, they comply with the New York Convention spirit. It, Indonesia has a quite notorious record, and they, uh, I mean, the judges, they, they turn down the foreign arbitral awards quite randomly. So there is no sort of, you know, um, fixed belief that Indonesia is very supportive in arbitration. And then in terms of capacity building, we see whether there are arbitration scholars, professors who can teach arbitration, whether there are lawyers who can specialize in arbitration, uh, whether the arbitration institutions, they provide workshops, conferences, dialogues, so that you know, the community is aware that arbitration is that important. Well, last but not the least, we tried to put the 12 jurisdictions into different levels of development. Um, the higher, the, uh, the bigger the number is, the higher the level they reach. So we put Singapore number one, Hong Kong sort of number two. So Singapore and Hong Kong, they're in the first tier. Australia, Malaysia, Korea, stage number three, or sort of, you know, 3.5. Korea is very aggressive these days. China, Japan, Taiwan, 2.5 something. They are moving on from stage two to stage number three. India, Philippines, stage number two. 
Vietnam, 1.5, Indonesia, 1. Uh, due to time limitation, I have to, to stop now. I know Johnny is very strict in time compliance. But if there are future questions, I'm very happy to entertain that. Thank you very much. Thank you.